This week on the Notorious Scoundrels podcast. Uh, he actually, he did the reverse to me. Like, I waited him out the other day. I felt, I felt like a champ. Yep. True story. Um, yeah. It's like, oh, I'm a genius. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I yeah. went last. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the Notorious Scoundrels, a podcast focused on tactics and competitive play for Star Wars Legion. Hosted by Kyle Dornboss, Michael Barry, and David Zelenka. With Jay Shalansky, the man behind the glass. Hello and welcome back to the Notorious Scoundrels podcast. I am Kyle. I'm here with Mike and David. How are you guys doing? Great. I painted my royal guard today. It was fantastic. Did you paint them red? No, I did oh. not paint them red. What is your mm-hmm. alternate scheme? They are Darth Vader lookalikes. Nice. So... It, when Operative Vader and his IRG counterparts come up in your grill, it just looks like a five-man hit team. So they're they're prime black, basically. Yeah, red visors, <laughs> great, <laughs> super easy. Took me like twenty minutes. <laughs> you got a you got a third color on there. I should have I should have probably started this army with them because uh, <laughs> yeah, but they're done. So yeah. there's that. Hey. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, at least we'll know who's is who's on the table, right? That's always the thing. When two like cannon scheme armies go up against each other, you're sort of like, who's yeah. or who's? And then maybe your bases are different, but still it's kind of confusing when they clash. Totally. totally. I've definitely seen I, like the bases be the same. And you're like, uh... <laughs> right. Your eyeballs kind of wiggle because you don't know what's going on. <laughs> yep. I also really just don't like the standard Royal Guard color scheme. Personally. I don't like how it's like 100% red. Yeah, the it whole just, thing's red. It just looks kind of corny. I don't yeah, know. it's red on red. Yeah. I, I tried to I'm, I tried to do a thing with them where I did some combination of like red and purple and brown and it just looked awful. So I'm probably going to end up painting them entirely red. <laughs> there you go. But yeah, it's the first edition uh, of the of the Dornboss Royal Guard where... Uh, various colors and it didn't work so um yeah if you're happy with your with your all black that seems good uh yeah. i've been painting b1s man this is a lot of b1s <laughs> i mean yeah uh, i'm even How like short want. taking shortcuts and man it's a lot of b1s even just like basing them you know like if you have a super simple basing scheme it doesn't matter when you gotta do it 50 times yeah, I mean, like, like, so we talked about this the other day, and I'm going to tangent because, you know, it's awesome. Um, but so, like, I, I put my um, my sand down, and then I prime everything, and then I just dry brush over the sand and then, like, glue some grass to the top. Is that what you would consider simple? Yeah, that qualifies. Okay. Yeah, that's actually okay. considerably simpler than... Um... I mean, I've got a couple methods uh, for my Rebels and Empire. I I do that. I put the sand down. I paint over the sand. And then I I paint it. I, I was going for, like, crate. So, um, yeah, I paint it red. And then I dry brush it lighter red. And then I spray, uh, like, white, like, basalt color white on it with an airbrush from a specific direction. Um, it's pretty cool. Pretty easy. And then the, the B1s are... Um, that uh, GW technical mud stuff and then uh, dry brush that bad boy and then throw some glue on there and sprinkle some grass on it. Um, and that's it. Not super complicated. That's, but that's not bad. Yeah, definitely time consuming when you got to do it 50 times. <laughs> yeah, man, just, just PVA glue, sand, yep. you're golden. Move on. That was my original intent. Um, but unfortunately, uh, it, like tan on tan if you're doing b1s in the in the bone white color scheme um yeah so th- i tried that and i was like oh <laughs> it's yeah, not gonna yeah. work <laughs> it's it, it becomes it's it's too neutral right there's no contrast yeah. and so you right, can't exactly. tell where the miniature ends and the base begins yep yeah it's just a giant beige blob um anyway so that was our hobby segment um <laughs> yeah. a good one too impromptu nice right. yeah it's uh right, i mean you on. know should, should we have started the cast with like something like this get out of here 
out your brush and paint. It's there you go. time. Yeah, well, I guess. See, we have a draft for that. Um, we do. Yeah, no, we're all we're all stuck inside painting, so that's what we're talking about. Uh, at least for the first five minutes of the show. Um, so we actually do have some other stuff to talk about today. We're gonna do an update on Yavin Base Team League. We are now in the finals, so David's gonna talk about that. Um, we're gonna uh, talk a little bit about Invader League because we got some very relevant updates for list building for Invader League, and then we're gonna today is all about force powers. So we're gonna go through all ten force powers and talk we're about. We're gonna go through our list of force powers. Yeah, I don't... <laughs> it's just me eyeballing, counting, um, and we're gonna go through you know what they're good for, how you use them, which force users you want them on, if any, and uh, yeah. So today's all about force powers. So first, let's hit the team league updates. What do you got for us, David? Well, so the Avon based team league is finally, finally finals. That's kind of the article, the article title I posted recently on Yavin blog. You also check it out. It has all the pertinent information in it in a very uh, succinct summarized form. Um, I can give you sort of the, an even briefer summary here over the, over the air. Um, so several months ago, 16 teams got together, teams of five got together into a league and we played a group stage and then eight of those teams went and got sewn into a single elimination phase. And now finally we are at the the pivotal moment here, the crux of the whole competition where the two teams that were left that were not defeated in the single elimination bracket are going to face each other in the finals. And um, those two teams are the irregular regulars, a team of, of hitherto unknowns who have slaughtered their way into the finals, uh, defeating some known players. And uh, that's going to be really exciting for them to, to watch. And then um, the other team is the uh, basic Bespin Biths, which is a uh, an interesting collection of uh, veteran players, including Luke Cook, the world champion, uh, Eric Reha, Daniel Lupo, a lot of folks that are sort of known names. It is an all-star cast of players. Uh, Starscream, and then um, Stevens. They're all playing together on this team league. They have set out to crush their enemies, and they may do that in the next few games. A um, couple of other news items. There's a giveaway to the players in the team league of a Corsa. This whole tournament, by the way, sponsored by our parent network, the Fifth Trooper. Um, so they are the uh, Fifth Trooper is doing um, has, has done giveaways. Um, they're giving away sleeves. They're giving away corsets. Um, they're going to supply the winning team with five sets of sidebars, a very significant prize. Um, and uh, the finals themselves are going to start pretty soon here. We're waiting to hear back from the team captains who are meeting and they're, they're pairing right now. They're trying to figure out who's playing who, what lists are matched up against whom, what maps they'll be playing on. There's a whole... Um, map veto and pairing phase that the teams have to go through. And you can read more about that at yavinbase.blog. There's plenty of, of information about the structure of the league there. Um, but suffice to say, there is a, a map pool phase where teams select the maps they're going to play on, and they reveal lists in sequence, and they match um, list to list back and forth. There's even like a team bidding structure where um, all five lists are totaled up and they create a total bid and whoever has the higher total bid gets to be the red team or the blue team. And that team will have the ability to veto maps first. They'll also be unfortunately forced to show their one of their lists first. And so there's kind of a, it's kind of complicated, but it's not that complicated once you do it. Um, but anyway, to the point, um, schedule is what I'm trying to get out here. Um, that's going to be made available both on yavinbase.blog and on the Yavinbase Facebook community page. Um, so feel free to visit that on Facebook and please do stay tuned to yavinbase.blog for more information about when that's coming. We're planning on streaming all the games um, up until the finals. If there is a, a clear winner by game three, we won't force them to play the rest of their games and they'll just pan the prize and say, you know, well done, your first to three. Um, but anyway, I'm super stoked for it and, and it's been a long time coming. And uh, the spiciest thing possibly about this uh, finals is that we now have vital assets available in TTS. And that is going to change everything, basically. Um, 
the structure of the whole league was based around a, a universe where vital assets did not exist and now it is going to exist and we're going to see what kind of chaos and fun and interest that will play uh with in the finals and uh it's important because vital assets is also legal for invader league so i'm going to talk about that maybe kyle about invader league if you if you have a, a yeah so this is a that. this is an update um Originally, the uh, organizers did not think it would be in the mod, um, but I guess they had some breakthroughs with with how to figure out how to get it in there. So uh, it is gonna, vital assets, and all of the cards are going to be legal for uh, the round robin phase of Invader League, which starts in just a few weeks. So um, if you're playing in Invader League, uh, yeah, keep that in mind. It's uh, you know we've talked extensively about vital assets on this show already. Um, I wrote an article about it. Uh, go check that out. So you know what to expect if you've never dealt with it. I would definitely, you know, if you're playing an Invader League, try and get some practice games in with it. So you, um, because it is uh, very different from the priority supplies and core set battle cards um, in a lot of in a lot of ways. In addition to the crazy combos you can create. So um, yeah, I would encourage oh, folks. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's uh, it's it's very interesting. It's going to really shake up the game um, for sure. So. Uh, yeah, go check that out. Uh, it's in the mod. Um, you know, go test it for functionality too. I know that uh, credit to the to the modding team. Uh, some of that stuff was pretty difficult to code. So, um, yeah, go mess around with it and uh, prepare your lists as if it's going to be in there because it will be. So, and it is fully it's fully implemented. Like we're talking like the bomb carts in there. There's all kinds of stuff in there that's been fully implemented. And um, one other thing that I didn't mention that will probably be relevant for Invader as well, is that the Yavin based Team League Finals is using silhouettes. We're going to be using the cylindrical silhouettes in the in the games, and I think that will also become relevant for Invader League as well, if I'm not mistaken. Good, good. Uh, yeah, silhouettes are also officially going to be legal for Invader, so... It's a whole new world. It's a whole new world. Like like Legion, like just changed overnight, and here it is now. This is this is now the new reality, and so it's going to be a an, an exploration of, of sorts. And we're gonna, I'm sure we're gonna run into all kinds of you know twists and turns and with rules and everything like that. And we'll figure out we'll have to figure that out as we go. Make some actual relevant judge calls. So navigating navigating new waters, right? Rather than reminding people of the old waters. <laughs> yep. Um, all right. Uh, well, should we move on to force powers? Sure. Sure. You got a, either Legion 101 or Tactics yeah, Drop there, Mr. Barry? I had a, a drop called force powers, Kyle? <laughs> 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 like, what is this? I mean, you know, this could be force powers. No, I mean, it's a... Uh... Get ready for advanced there tactics. Go. There you go. <laughs> that, that, yeah. that didn't seem very loud. Let me Let me try that again. Okay. Get ready for advanced. That was quieter. Get ready for advanced we tactics. <laughs> we'll figure this out one day. <laughs> I think this was just done. kind of quiet generally. Yeah, professionals. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've been doing this for almost two years. I know. It's kind of crazy. It is. We have gotten better at it. We'll we'll eventually, probably by the third year, we'll figure out the drops. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. To be fair, Jay used to just do them and insert them in after. Right, That's he would just yeah. right. He would do it live, like we're doing. Yeah, um, a thousand monkeys at a thousand typewriters. <laughs> anyway, go on. Uh, all right, let's let's. Uh, so we're just going to go down here on the list. Um, let's start with force push. Let's let's start with the best one. <laughs> Man, all right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go with the Kyle Dornbow special here. We could have a whole episode about force push. <laughs> is that is that a line that I use? I don't know. Why don't you ask? I don't, every time you say it, I'm like, oh, here he goes again. Okay. <laughs> well, this is um, our, this is our episode. This is our chance to talk about force push. Right. Um. Yeah. So force push is gotta be the most powerful and diverse um uh force power on 
in the game, right? Like that it's probably the best upgrade in the game, period. End of story. Um I'm sure that maybe some people are willing to debate that fact. But um for ten points you get to move your opponent's units. Um and on its face, uh that feels really powerful. Turns out it's like I don't know, five or six times stronger than that if once you kind of figure out like how you can manipulate that ability in such a way as to abuse the rules. Yeah, I mean, there's very few abilities in the game that allow you to do things with your opponent's unit. Um, pretty much all of them, except this one, are relegated to command cards. Um, and being able to move your opponent's unit is... Uh, extremely flexible um there's a couple things to note about this uh a you do not need line of sight like all force powers um so range one you know from the opposite side of a line of sight blocker that's perfectly legit um you get to do the cohesion of the unit in addition to you know moving the unit leader speed one so this is effectively like you know you move the unit leader speed one which is roughly four inches uh and then you also get to drop the other dudes, which could be another like four inches from the unit leader. Um, so one super common use of this is if you have a melee force user like Luke, uh, is if you are on the other side of a line of sight blocker, you can basically like wrap them around it, you know, to where you can then charge them safely on your side of it. Um, you know, you move the unit leader uh, and then you, you move the dudes closer to you on your side of it and then you charge them and then engage them in a safe spot. Um, you can use that to, to yank them out of cover. You know, if they're in a good cover spot, you yank them out towards your guys, um, take a shot at them with another unit afterwards. Um, you know, you can push them off an objective. There's just like a million things you can do with force push. Trigger your own standbys. Yep. Um, which is a big one that, uh, you know, if, if you catch somebody unsuspecting, that's a really big deal. A lot of people won't see a double move force push, um, coming because they'll be like oh if he does that um like that's a very risky play turns out it's a lot less risky if you kill whatever you're force pushing um, mm -hmm. a lot of the time so uh just keep that in mind and th especially with like um you know kenobi and and phase two clones that that sort of thing is a little bit more in the cards it's easier to set up because you're taking standbys naturally as part of your strategy. So. Yep. And you generally are going to, you're going to have overwatch on several units also. Um, yeah. And you can share standbys. So yeah, that's probably the most uh, effective use of pulling stuff into standbys, but this has been kind of a staple even for, um, you know, Vader and Luke lists too. Uh, needless to say, if you see your opponent accumulating standbys and they have a force user and you have a unit within range three of that force user, um, <laughs> you might want to move on. <laughs> you should you should consider consider your your life choices. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and as you noted, it's it's sort of like it's longer than you think the threat range of a force user should be. Insofar as usually you think of it as as charge range, which is for most of them as range two, right? But it's essentially yeah. like you know a further range one from that. Totally. And, and it's kind of weird because you can actually be like outside of range three yourself from whatever it, I mean, outside of f like firing at range three from a force user and end up getting force pushed if you're kind of cohered weirdly. Um, and so it's just, you got to kind of, you, you really need to keep it in mind when, you know, if, if you're not setting up any way to punish them at the end of the turn like you don't have any standby set up of your own um to prevent the force user from doing that um they can kind of just you know throw your squad or your hero um out into the waiting guns of the enemy army um, yep and one like one niche niche use of this particular you know pulling stuff into standbys is, is with limited viz um you know, like on the first or second turn when things are range two or three, it's it's a lot harder to strip standbys, and it's it's very common just as a general course of action to to move up and then take a standby, right? Because the attack range on the first turn is the same as every unit standby range. Um, 
so you know if <laughs> and then at the end of the turn you move your force user up and you pull a unit into range two of like five or six standbys <laughs> on the first turn when you thought they were safe um so yeah keep that in mind too on limbas in particular but um, it's an interesting also... beast. Sorry, go on. Go no, on. after you. I'll... So it's it's an interesting beast to this force push thing. I was thinking about the interaction between two Jedi using force push, and I was thinking, well, the guy that goes last, he usually has the upper hand because that force push is you know done reactively, so to speak. But we've been talking here about force push as a proactive measure, which is I'm going to use it to attack you, or I'm going to use it to shove you into my trap, so to speak. That is the standby you know, cackle, whatever you have as a clone player. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, is what are your thoughts? Is force push more reactive or is it just a, you know, and if, if it's not being used reactively, is it just, you know, free stuff on top of what you, whatever you brought, you uh, know, to do something amazing that other people can't do, you know, other units that are not force users can't do. I think it, the answer to that question is it very much depends. And I think you're you're right in bringing up the situation where there's a force push on both sides of the table um, because that changes the dichotomy of how the force push is used, right? So if I have force push and you don't, nine times out of 10, it is a proactive, like I'm, I'm making your life miserable because I can move your stuff and you can't move mine. And um, yes, you can use it defensively, but often if you're using it defensively in that situation, you're actually using it so that your force user can be offensive and you're using it to like suck units into melee with your force user. So he can't be shot. Um, and so in that regard, it's still a bit proactive. But mm -hmm. I think that the situation that you mentioned where that there's a force user on, you know, each side, um, it's a little bit of who blinks first, right? Like the first person that like tries to jump in there and force push, um, like if, the, if they don't seal the deal, they're in a very bad spot almost immediately. Um, and it becomes kind of this, you know, okay, who who gets to go last you know there's a, there's a lot of standing orders with my order goes on my force user and hoping you win the roll off in games like that just because you want to be the guy that's like okay well i set my standbys up and i'm gonna throw you out you know when you can't respond to me right um and i think that you know and, and the other thing is that you just you can't go first with your force user because if you do they will do the same thing to you right um I don't know. I, I feel like I've played so many games like this with Kyle and like I always am the first one to blink. I'm like, I'm going first. I'm going to do it. I've got him this time. And then I do it and then I like everything goes poorly. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, 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 okay, okay. Yeah. He actually, he did the reverse to me. Like I waited him out the other day and I felt, I felt like a champ. <laughs> yep. True story. Um, yeah. It's like, oh, I'm a genius. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, yeah. I went last. <laughs> yeah. I mean, generally, he's playing lists that uh, are better at waiting, waiting people out. Um, I tend to be playing more aggressive lists, so it makes a little bit more sense. Well, and this is a total tangent, but uh, in these contexts, you're often playing Vader, and I'm often playing Luke. And Luke is a yes. more passive, reactive force user than Vader is. So. Yeah, that's absolutely true. A, a lot of the time I am forced to go first just yep. because I can't sit there and wait. Yep. Um, so speaking of uh, specific force users, um, what force users are you not taking this on? Let's start there. Oh, boy. Um, I think it, if there's any force user you don't take force push on, it's Palpatine. Okay, yeah, that's like the one. Yep. Uh, I think... I think if if you're playing competitive Legion and that's what this podcast is about, so whatever, uh, every force user is their points cost on their unit card plus 10 points because this is immediately attached to them when you take them. If you're taking a force user that's not Palpatine and it doesn't have force push attached to it, you did something wrong. And I I feel pretty confident about saying that. 
It's it definitely seems like uh I mean if you have a four slot and you're not palpatine, this is this is the first thing that you fill it with. Yeah. Um and it's just kind of like, you know, force users are expensive. We don't have any cheap force users. Um it's just kind of like a thing that force users can do. Um, yeah. And and I would go as far as to say if like all right, I'm at like 770 points and I have the choice between putting force push on my force user and taking a heavy weapon in a core unit squad. I'm taking force push 100% of the time. Yep. Yeah. It's one of those effects that is just so unique and so game altering. Um, I just don't see how you could leave it home unless you had some really good reason for it. Like, I'm not going to be in the middle of a fight until turn whatever when I'm doing my now you will die like Palpatine does. Yep. Well, and I think the reason, so let's talk about real quick why you don't take it on Palpatine. Um, in my experience, it's just that Palpatine is, for the most part, a ranged force user. Right? Like, I find that it's, like, it does happen that he's at range one of stuff, but it's not a guarantee. Um you know, you can go an entire game where Palpatine, you know, the only things he interacts with are when he's zapping them with lightning at range two, or he's just using pull the strings the entire game. Whereas if you have, you know, pretty much every other force user, um, including Commander Vader, who is also speed one, you're going to be much more in your opponent's face and you're much more likely to have the opportunities to use that force push. Um, I still think there's a case to be made to take it on Palpatine uh, to use it defensively. You know, it is handy yeah. there. Um, but I also think uh, that you, it's not necessarily mandatory on him just because you don't always get a chance to use it. Yeah, I, I feel like on Palp, it's like a nice to have, but in a list that's so strapped for points, it's very difficult to fit a nice to have into that list. Yeah. I mean, usually, and I've built a lot of different Palpatine lists, you're, you're to the point where like, well, I could spend these 10 points, but then I'd have to go down to nine activations. And yeah. it's just not worth it. Yeah, it hurts you more uh, than it helps you. Yeah. So, all right. So let's. Uh, so that was force push. I assume that will be the the one that we spend the longest amount of time on. <laughs> probably. Pr- probably. I yeah. I um. I. I think that like overall, like if if you don't understand the conversation we're having around force push, like you just need to use it more. Yeah. Just play around like, with it. Like, like play around with it more. There will be a, a moment where it clicks where, you know, you'll be like across from an opponent who took a force user that doesn't have force push and you'll have one that has force push and realize, Oh my God, like I am, I am so advantaged because of this. And, and once you start, like once that's sort of thinking starts clicking, you, you'll understand. So yeah, here, here's a hot take force push. If force push didn't exist, I don't know if you'd see some of the force users we see right now being played competitively. I agree to some extent. Um, I think that you could argue that the unit you're taking is force push, and these are all just like 160 point upgrades. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, they, they I mean that things. might be a little bit of an exaggeration, but like, I, I, I do think that there is something to to that sentiment in that, like, the ability force push. Like if you if you had a, a unit that was 150 points, Master of the Force won and didn't have an attack, like you might still take it. Yeah, you might still take it because Force Push is so good. I mean, if yeah. they had like some kind of command cards and stuff, I don't know. Well, yeah, yeah, okay. There has, I mean, obviously, yeah. this is a hypothetical I, unit. You know? Yeah. Yeah, but I, I get what like, you're saying. I, like, I don't think I don't think at their current price point, I don't think you take Luke or Vader if they don't have access to Force Push. Operative Luke, yes. Okay, well, maybe Operative Luke doesn't need it because he has disengage. Well, it's yes, it's uh, not as yeah. critical for Operative Luke, but Look, it, he has like he has like fifty percent of a Force Push. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what he has. Um, I could see taking I mean, Dooku, Operative Luke. And Obi Wan, and of course Palpatine. If you if Force Push is just deleted from the game, yeah, I don't know. I don't know about Commander. I don't know about either version of Vader or Commander Luke. Vader needs it really badly. Yeah, frankly, it's just 
Um, Luke can live without it, but it's a, t- a tough road to hoe. Maybe, maybe a <laughs> okay. Um, maybe a better way to put this is that force push is what makes a lot of force users good. It's certainly what makes them unique. Yes, it 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 is the thing that they bring to the table that a, another hundred and forty plus unit does not. Right. right? Um, it is the irreplaceable effect on a force force user. Um, a lot of the other effects uh, that you can put in the force slot that we're going to talk about shortly here um, are replicatable in some fashion, with some exceptions. Yeah, and this is. This is another tangent, but this is why as a CIS player, I don't really like Grievous. Because like, <laughs> I mean, he's great at killing stuff, but I can buy other units that kill stuff. Sure. You know, I'd rather just yeah. pay the extra 30 points and get Dooku, who does much more unique things that I can't get from the other units in my army. But that's just me. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I, I think uh, to go down this rabbit hole, the fundamental difference that you're that is a real cost there is the lack of uh, charge relentless on Dooku. Yep. Personally sure. is how I feel about that. Right. But yeah. Right. But Grievous is kind of the embodiment of what we're talking about, right? He's a saber wielder who is fast and has a strong attack and he doesn't have force powers. Yeah. That's why he gets mulched by most, most force users. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, all right. Let's move on. Um, so the next one here on our list is battle meditation. Yeah, so battle meditation is probably I think battle meditation is the coolest card that fills this slot. Um, it's certainly the most uh, like the card that you can get the most creative with. Um, I don't think it's very good right now. There are some niche uses of it, but yeah, I generally agree. It was stronger yeah. before HQ uplink. Generally uh, yeah. speaking, I mean, uh, yeah, I think that that's fair. Um, I, you know, I don't know. It's it's one of the few force upgrades that I do think is like uh, you put on Palpatine. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of to come back to Pal, but um, you know, battle meditation with like given to your anger is very good. Yep. You know. Um, yeah, and Palpatine is often more timing neutral too, so you don't necessarily need an order on him on those turns where you, um, you know, it's not super clear from the card text, but like if you if you have a card like Given Your Anger that has a, you ignore bo- both the range and the unit type restriction on there. So like Given Your Anger says you give an order to Palpatine. Well, Battle Meditation allows you to ignore that and just give an order to whoever you want. So um, yeah, I think right, there's some uses for it on him. This is to say that f- most force users order tokens are precious and they yes. don't want to lose them. And battle meditation is antithetical to that idea. But like you said, Palpatine is pretty timing neutral. Uh, he's probably going to give a fair order to the guards anyway. And then he can just pick whatever unit he wants to to order around. Yeah, I mean, I also think that this was a little bit different even just a couple months ago when comms relay was like comms relay chains were a thing. Being able to like bat med your shores, put an order down, generate like three more orders from it, a bunch of surge tokens and a bunch of aim tokens makes battle meditation way better um, than it is if you can't replicate it with comms relay. So, yeah. um, you know. <sighs> Yeah, so I think yeah. that's a, that's a reason there's a place for it on Dooku. Totally. Yes. Uh, though, I mean, I think uplinks end up filling that space way more than meditation. You know, yeah, I was just sorry. Go on. No, I mean, I agree with you generally. I think the exception to that is if you're running Staps, um, which we just recently saw the preview for. You know, if they play anything like speeder bikes, they'll often be kind of far. But they can coordinate to each other, right? So you use Batman on Tuku, give one of those orders to, um, you know, step number one, and then step number one bounces it to the other two. And then you've got your uplinks or whatever, the second order on your card to start your B1 chain with. And then everybody's got an order except Dooku, who's in the bag by himself. So I was just thinking about the interaction between Dooku and Double the Fall, because he can give away that order token. 
he doesn't have to even doesn't have to even stay there to be removed by the double fall effect. So that's another another you know niche for a battle meditation to rest in. Is that? No, I that's, think that's, no, I think it's not. Accurate. Accurate. Oh, he has to retain the. Oh, he needs a face up. Yeah, for he has to work. retain the. Nah. Yep. Okay, chasing phantoms. Knew, knew where you were going with that. Yeah, yep. I thought he didn't. I thought he wouldn't have to, but whatever. See, I don't play CIS enough. Yeah, that'd be yeah. that'd be like a no brainer on him if. Uh, yeah, if that was possible. That yeah, yeah, you do just take it on him. Yeah. Yep. Anywho, it's also why. Um, in a Dooku mirror match, whoever gets to trigger their double to fall first um, is advantaged pretty significantly because the second person won't be able to kick theirs back to to kick the order off Grievous right. or whatever. In fact, that's always blue because it's a tied priority. Yeah. And blue's, blue special effects trigger first no matter what. Yep. So, rip. <laughs> yeah. Hope, hope you brought a bid. <laughs> yeah, bid. Bit as bit as separatists. Um, it's also somewhat less effective in a mirror, just because it's possible that you're kicking Dooku's token back to an empty bag. Yeah, uh, totally. yeah, it could be a nothing, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, next one on my list here is Force Reflexes. Hmm. Now just ten points. I mean, it's been yeah. ten points for a while, but it is subtle, but it is one of my favorite cards of all the Force powers because of the nature of deflect and the number of force users i like to play that require deflect to be survivable beyond that of a stormtrooper <laughs> yeah, yeah that's fair this is this is the force power that i always want but never have the room to buy that's uh, that's a great description of it yeah like like i always want this but generally it's hedged out by whatever like if if it's operative vader or commander vader for that matter it's like force push force choke saber throw or force push force choke or you know on on luke you know you're taking force push jedi mind trick which we'll talk about later and like it's just i want it (laughs) really badly but it's just i don't know maybe we can address also this idea that force reflexes rewards you for going early because if you don't go early you don't really get to use the dodge but you'd rather not get shot so it's there's a a kind of a cross agenda thing going on here where it's like i'd like to have the extra save but it also like never to be hit so if i spend 10 points for this and never get hit was that just 10 points i flushed down the toilet hard to know that's i mean i think that you know there's something to be said for that because a lot of the times when you're playing a force user, um, if you're playing them correctly, you're not being super aggressive um, most of the time, which means your force user is generally going last. And because of that, it makes reflexes a little bit not great. Now, it's great if you like are in a Jedi duel and you go with your one pip first and you're like, okay, I hit you dodge right for free. Right. And like, sometimes you can take multiple dodge tokens and in those situations it's huge. Um, but uh, yeah. Right. Cause you know, you're going to have to make a number of defenses after the fact. And so then you have like a stack that you can work with and it's like, okay, well I can be, you know, defensive, as many times as necessary. Dooku is one of those too, because he likes to be aggressive with cunning. And so yes. force reflexes is very good on him mm-hmm. because that lets him be defensive. Cause he's one of those, he's just like Luke in the defense department. He has six wounds with red deflect and he needs, he needs the deflect and he needs the surge tokens from aggressive tactics to stay alive when he makes his cunning moves. But Luke is not, you know, Luke is like you say, because totally reactive or almost totally reactive. He's like 90% reactive when you play him. And so free flex is not, not that good of a sell on him, maybe operative because you get it, you get it back for free. That's the other thing. Master of the force makes reflexes so much better Mm -hmm. because it's It's, it's working in the background. It's a really big deal. I I do think that um, the two characters that are most likely to want this are operative Luke, who is probably less likely to want it than Tuku. Um, and they want them, th- those two characters specifically, for two two reasons in particular. 
Um, they both have Master of the Force. In Dooku's case, he has Master of the Force 2, which is huge. And they both have three Force slots. And the addition of the, the third Force slot, I think, is really what allows them to take this card. Um, in contrast to some of the other Force users like Kenobi or Commander Luke or Operative Vader. Yep. And uh, especially in Dooku's case, because he has a native ranged attack on his unit card that is good. So he doesn't, you know, there are there's a case to be made for taking Saber Throw so he can use it with his one pip um, to make an awesome ranged attack. But it's hardly necessary on him. You know, like Commander Vader has three Force slots, but Commander Vader isn't attacking anything outside of melee range if you don't give him Saber Throw. Um, whereas Dooku has that printed on his card. So, yeah, I think there's a strong contention for that to be Dooku's third uh, force power beyond push and choke. Yep. Uh, sorry, I take that back. I, I missed one person that should have reflexes, and that's Kenobi. I, I was like, oh, Kenobi doesn't mm-hmm. want it. Don't, bro. Kenobi wants force reflexes. Yeah. Might be. Uh, <laughs> just kind of like he checking wants the boxes. An additional chance to use Sorosu Mastery. Yeah, that's sort of his thing. Um, yeah. And, and for ways. that reason... He likes to go early because of Suresu a lot of the time, um, which is interesting. He plays, I think, the most differently out of every Force user, personally. He definitely takes the, the um, you know, using the Force for knowledge and defense and not for attack. He definitely takes that theme really far because yeah. he's, being ag- he's being aggressive, but he's also being defensive at the same time. He's just yeah. a very he's a very interesting interesting playstyle that I'm definitely not wrapping my head around totally. Yeah, he's the most purely defense. I mean, he's the only force user that can defend directly defend other units. So right. Um, all right. They're good units to defend. Too. They are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, let's hit uh, guidance. Oh, this one's kind of a. Mm. This card is bad. Don't take it. Yeah, it, <laughs> I was gonna say awkward, but uh. <laughs> well, well, it's 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 like reflexes. It's like I want I, it'd be nice. Can I actually spend a four slot on this? Two surges it's, is not that much. It's so, not even the four slot so much as the timing. Mm-hmm. What's well, another early card, right? Right. There's only one force user that remotely wants this card, and it's Kenobi. Because look, so here's the thing, right? Free surge tokens are great. Okay. Surge tokens from reliable and aggressive tactics are great. They're they're basically free. They don't cost you much, right? And they happen um, at the start of the turn without you having to do anything. They also that is also true. Yeah. The thing about it is that there's a lot of turns if you're in a non-clone army where like you don't use them, right? Like you got you have these surge tokens on these units and and you don't use them. Um, and that's okay because you're accumulating value with reliable or um, aggressive tactics over the course of the game. Like it's not about I spent surge token on turn X. It's I spent X amount of surge tokens over the course of the game, which netted me this amount of value, right? And so when we're looking at guidance, it's like, oh, I can put down two surge tokens in a very like on a not timing neutral activation unlike you know being able to like spotter or take cover with an officer and to boot like you're not even guaranteed to use them like at least with reflexes you're like oh i have a dodge token on a very important unit i'm going to use it right as opposed to like guidance is like well maybe i'll roll a surge like yeah i don't know yeah i I'm mean the clone i'm with you on that too i mean i think the clone army definitely helps you know, helps you make up for that kind of weirdness or awkwardness you know because you're able to share it and like the clones are the hungriest army for surges for sure of all the facts that's definitely true yeah, yeah you're so much I mean, more likely to be able to use it yeah so um and all of that is to say, like, not even to bring in the conversation that this slot is super competitive to begin with, mm-hmm. right? And so, like, right. we're looking at the likes of Force Push and Force Choke and Jedi Mind Trick and and all this other stuff, and it's just like, eh, I can get a lot more bang for my buck that I know I'm going to use for 10 points. Yep. And a Force Slot. I agree. Plus, if I'm taking on an OE1, 
right? I have General Kenobi, in which my army is awash in surges. <laughs> not only that, not only that is that you you on your General Kenobi turn you have like twenty to thirty surge tokens, but like you also have in most of the competitive lists nowadays somewhere between two and four phase twos. So you're starting the turn with two to four surge tokens from that. Plus you, you Kenobi probably has aggressive tactics, so you're netting another one yeah. to three from that. So, so like uh, they they abound. They're everywhere. Yeah. So like, what's two more? Right. It's Not much. Of, yep. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh choke. This is my favorite horsepower. <laughs> and well, you mainly cool. because you guys don't have access to it. Uh yeah. Hey, come <laughs> on. Look, I play separatist too. What do you Yeah. He says he plays separatist. And like Empire. he's like play, played them in real life, like outside of like one tournament where look, man. he like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I played a lot of. I played a ton of uh, Palpatine. I just don't particularly take Choke. Yeah, Choke is really good. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Um. So what? What's the? What are the obvious strong uses? Right, killing heavy weapons. Number one. I think the the best use of it is probably to kill a medic, but uh, heavy weapons definitely. Like anything that has a special thing to do in a in a squad like this is what you uh you're you're using i I mean i don't know what else to Mm -hmm. say it's just like kill stuff with it so i will say this i have found most of the value in choke to be in situations not i mean so don't get me wrong killing heavy weapons is great but it's sort of doubles as an extra force push Mm. and what i mean by that is that a lot of times when you're in melee with uh, a force user um they will kind of grapple things into them like force push things into them so they can't get shot um a lot of times what i find myself doing is not using the full value of Pierce on my lightsaber, leaving a unit leader up in whatever squad I'm attacking, and then just choking it out the next turn if I don't have any um, like really sweet targets for choke. Uh, and it allows me to keep my force push up. Yep. Um, and so it it's a little bit more flexible than I'm just going to kill a dude, right? Um, in, in that regard, it becomes this kind of like, okay, well... You know, I, I attack the squad that already activated this turn. I'm just going to only kill four out of five with my Pierce through your lightsaber instead of all five. Um, and it, it presents some um, interesting, you know, play dynamics that way. Yep. And there are most force users that this is good on. So this is essentially Vader and Dooku. Um, Palpatine being the other Sith that as we mentioned, is often not within range one of stuff. Um, Palpatine and, I'm sorry, Dooku and Vader both have tools to bring units closer to them when they can then choke them, even if they can't necessarily attack them directly. Out. So, you know, for Vader, for Operative Vader, you've got Scatter. Um, you can use Scatter. Dooku, to... you've got scatter. Right, Dooku also has Scatter. Right, they both have Scatter. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they both, of course, have Force Push, which you can use to pull stuff closer to you. Um, Dooku has his three pip, which, you know, after he attacks something, you perform a speed two move with it, which speed two plus cohesion is, is going to get you <laughs> within choke range. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, commander Vader has, um, obviously force push. So, um, I think scatter is probably the biggest tool there. Uh, you know, cause then you can scatter and then force push and then choke. Um, but uh, yeah, they 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 have tools to get stuff within range because range one is kind of short. Yeah, it is, um, and that's that's the thing that makes this power not like silly. Yeah, I mean, if it was range two, it'd be busted, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> sort of like another force power we're going to talk about next. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but speaking of power, but yeah, I take. mean. <laughs> You know, uh, I think scatter really elevates the uh, choke. Scatter plus push um, makes choke really insane in situations where it otherwise wouldn't be. Um, Just because you can, like, move 
at least in Operative Vader's case, you can move Relentless, uh, force throw something with his ranged attack, <clears throat> scatter it, force push them, and then like choke something out, and then move back to wherever you were. Um, or or move and, into melee with them if they've activated oh, already. Absolutely, or move yeah. into melee with them. You know, there, it, there's a, a, a lot of... The decision tree is very complicated when it comes to that unit. Um, but... It yeah, it opens up a lot of possibilities. Yep. Can I can I just say sometimes it's not complicated? Yeah, totally. Uh, Dooku sometimes swings at Tauntauns, misses the misses the second miniature by one wound. Nope. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He just chokes it out and kills it. And it's like this is just a free it's a free additional wounding piercing wound, essentially. Yep. So it like yeah, raises I mean... the it raises the value of your saber to four, basically, if you have pierce three. If because you're already in melee, right? And yeah, for five points, that's a steal, man. That's like one of the best five point powers that exists. I and mean, uh, it's probably the best five. Point yeah, power actually, yeah. Actually, yeah. Actually, when, when it's when one. it's being used, I see that look on your face, Kyle. But I mean, like you can you can rip four heavies out of an army without them going with choke. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, Master of the Force. <laughs> like yep. it's 100 percent master of the you know, force it, if you last first into like a clone ball like they don't have any heavies left after mm-hmm. that like it's just over yep um, so shall we shall we talk about jedi mind trick since, yeah we shall since, yeah since it looks like kyle wants to battle on which force <laughs> <power is> better. <laughs> well you said best force power for five points and then you qualified when you're using the effect <laughs> um, so I actually I think this is going to be a hot take I think Mind Trick is better than Choke simply because it's range 2 instead of range 1 I think the effect yeah. is slightly weaker but you're using it more often yeah it's... Jedi Mind Trick is dirty is it, is. it is Yeah. I don't know man auto wounding is pretty good <laughs> okay yeah Yeah. so here, here's here's my issue with the differences between Choke and Jedi Mind Trick Choke is range one. Choke cannot target the insanely valuable units of your opponent, specifically characters. Mind trick is range two and can. Like, I I feel bad for the guy who's like, you know what? I'm gonna bring Han Solo uh, <laughs> this week, and and his yeah. opponent's got Operative Luke, and he's just like, yeah, Jedi mind trick you, Jedi mind trick you again, Jedi mind trick you, and you're just always suppressed, right? Yeah. And sometimes probably panicking because Jedi mind trick because Operative Luke went last first on you, and uh, it's just all bad news all the time. So I don't know. Uh, like similarly, I as someone who's been like playing Operative Vader a lot lately, I see Jedi Mind Trick on the other side of the table, and I'm like, uh, yeah, it's real good on this, uh, against. This him. doesn't feel great, right? Yeah. So like, um, I don't know. I I think that they should share the same restrictions. Maybe maybe range aside, they should share the same targeting restrictions. Is how I feel about it. But anyways, we can continue. Yeah, so that's not the world we currently live in. So, um, <laughs> that's not, uh, uh, anyway, let's um, talk about how to use this and who to put it on. Um, I mean, it's so one thing you mentioned if you're using it on a unit with Master of the Force, uh, like Jedi Luke or like Obi Wan, um, you know, the effect is cumulative across turns insofar as obviously. Suppression gets stripped at the end of the turn. They get stripped by things like endurance and strict orders. But if you've got Master of the Force, you know, I've run a lot of Jedi Luke, and I think probably 85% of the time, uh, if I use both push and mind trick, I'm refreshing mind trick instead of push. Um, you know, we just got done talking at the beginning of this show about how powerful the push effect is. But I think generally, like, you know, once you're stuck in and you've used force push once, to me, at least with Jedi Luke, the mind trick effect is more valuable cumulatively from one turn to the next. Um, yeah, I mean, the fact that he has disengaged is also a big deal. There. Right, right. Totally. Uh, um, mind trick also does not exist in a vacuum because suppression is a thing, is an army wide thing. Yep. Yeah. And you also have units that are really good at generating suppression called snipers. 
and displacing tons. You have like all all these all these things. So JMT kind of like it, it just enhances whatever you're doing on the suppression front, right? Yeah. Like I say it's cumulative across turns. It's also important to note that the more suppression you get on a target, the harder it is to remove without mm -hmm. spending an action to recover it. And so if you get past a certain threshold, barring some extremely lucky event, that unit is like perma suppressed, essentially, and yep. is going to be kept there by mind trick. Yep, exactly. And it's obviously this um, sets up your serve effect, serve your master well with Luke. Um, yeah, I mean, for that reason, it's stapled to Luke. Like, I... There is no way you're taking serve and not mind trick. Yeah, you need an activator. Yep. I mean, you could always I use it on one of your own units, I guess. But it's nice to have that ace in the hole to use it on a unit of death troopers or something to frag Krennic. Right. <laughs> serve, <laughs> serve is terrible. By the way, serve is terrible against droids. There's literally nothing you can do with it. Yeah. There are no units in the droid army that are vulnerable to serve. Mm -hmm. Zero. Just for the record, because no one, no one is ever suppressed. It's just it, no one is affected by it. Well, except the characters, and you can't use serve on characters. You can't exactly you can't use serve on characters. Yeah. Yep. So, um, and anyway, and as, as an aside, this is one of the places where JMT falls flat. Other JMT's than still pretty good against Grievous, though. Right. Other than yeah, that's the one character that's really stellar on <laughs> having serve, having serve isn't, but mind trick is. Having caused Grievous to panic off the board under the weight of sniper's fire and mind trick suppression. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's, that's a regular occurrence, actually, if you don't play your Grievous correctly. That will happen to you against Luke. He will make you panic off the board. Yeah. So you're taking this on, you're stapling this to both versions of Luke along with Force Push. Um, do you take this on Kenobi? Hmm. Uh, that is that's a I have I have no con, no convincing answer because OB doesn't have a ranged attack. Um, so I mean, I think the short answer is no. The longer answer is like it would be really nice, but I think you want force push on him because he's a force user, and you want reflexes because Cerasi is really good. Yeah, yeah, I'm a fan of the fire supported saber throw. But we can get. Well, there's we'll also. Get, I mean, yeah. We'll be getting there in a get, second. Get kind of dirty with that too. You can too. Do oh that, yeah. But give me give um, me those keywords on a dice pool I could use. Anyway, I, I do think that that's a little bit more like magical Christmas land type stuff. A little, a little bit. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> I think there's a, a world. Bit. <laughs> I think there's a world where you're making like an Obi Wan list, and you're just a couple points short of being able to take reflexes, and you're like, well, I guess I'll settle for JMT. Yes, I yeah. that that I could see maybe. Although you probably just want the bid. Yeah, you mean well, just something we didn't force slot empty? Yes. Uh, I mean, like if it, if the, if it's a difference. Well, I guess if I don't know, we'd have to. Yeah, I guess if you can't pay for. There's a. I think there's a world where you take yeah. it, okay. simply because it's five points cheaper than reflexes. Did we mention that Mind Trick kills Standby? No. That's also a big deal. We didn't, but that's a big deal. Yeah. That that was like the number one reason I brought it in ye olden days when Krennic was new. Mm -hmm. um, that it would it would kill kill a deploy the Garys in Standby. Yeah. One of the best uses of it. Push yeah. one and trick the other, and they would both disappear. And you felt pretty good about your life. Assuming they both so, can't see you because as soon as you do one of those two things, the other one would shoot you. Right. Well, that was that was the notion is like you you hide behind the wall nearby. Yeah. And then you do those things. Better one than both, right? Oh, totally. Of course. Especially if you yeah. have like um, full surprises or something. Yeah. Right. <laughs> sure, Death Troopers, shoot me. With a dodge yeah, please, trigger. I would love to. I would love to deflect three wounds back at you and kill half your squad. Yeah. Uh, all right, uh, let's roll through the rest of these because uh, we're running out of time. Um, yeah, these, these are, are all pretty easy ones, though. Uh, anger. Uh, I put it on Palpatine. Have fun during it. Now you will die, basically. Yeah, anger on Vader had a moment. 
No, it didn't. Mm, like, yeah. like I mean, like people no? wanted it. People wanted it to be a thing. The thing about it was that if like if Vader was in any place to take wounds, he was either too far away to use the aim tokens he got from this, or he had already gone mm-hmm. because yeah. he's in melee already. So it's just it's just like like if you're in the thick of it with Vader and there's like other stuff going on, generally you're like, okay, I delete this unit. You go first, delete two units, and then you're like, okay, well you've got nothing left, so the turn's great. But like anger doesn't work very well that way, so I don't know. I think this is uh, it's such a weird power because it is I think the without question the first power you take with Palpatine. And I personally would not run Palpatine without it, but I don't think it's like remotely in contention for anybody else. Well, it's also like the only power he takes a lot of the time. So Yeah, I usually run him with just that and his other two force slots empty, personally. Yeah. Which is bizarre because it's such a competitive slot, but on him, it, you know, A, you don't have the points, he, and B, the other stuff isn't super helpful for someone that plays like he does. The rules I'm are just over here, like, him. like, please, I, if you're not going to use Master of the Force 2, I would love to have it, you know, like, yeah, God. <laughs> like, I'd almost uh, rather he had like two command slots instead of uh, three four slots that he's not using. Oh, totally. He would love to have strict and aggressive. Oh, yeah. Yep. Oh, God. Strict guards with discipline. Ugh, never suppressed. Yep. Not only that, but like strict on an entire legion is also very good. Yeah. yeah. The entire army just gets to remove one suppression. Nice. Yeah, let's just make all those command slots do esteemed leader, strict, and aggressive tactics. Call it yeah. a day. Um, yeah. All right, so anger. Staple to Palpatine. Don't take it on anyone else. It's a short version. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's 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 talk about fear and hope together. Um, fear dishes out a suppression for free at the beginning of your turn. Range two, hope is the reverse. It's inspire. So budget Jedi mind trick. Kind of um, fear is kind of a lot worse though because of the timing. I think. Here's the issue with these cards. They're cheap, which is great, but the four slot doesn't really care about how much the force upgrade costs. It's about what the force upgrade does most of the time like if force push costs you 20 points you would still take it over just about everything in this list most of the time if their costs stayed the same so like the fact that these are three points and do something marginal is like i think in like a situation where like we're talking about palpatine like maybe fear is okay but like he's also really far away from stuff. But if you don't have empty four slots, normally, I don't think these upgrades are good. Yeah, it's just such a competitive slot. Um, I've taken I've taken fear on Dooku in situations where like I can't fit reflexes and I need to shave off seven points, but I'm not quite willing to leave that four slot empty. Um, like it's fine, you know. Uh, and then I've taken hope on Jedi Luke for similar reasons. Um, because three points is not a lot. But yeah, usually no. you're just you're just going to find the points somewhere else in your list to upgrade that to a 5.4 force upgrade or a 10.1. Um, but I, I think these could be free and most force users still would not touch them. Yep. Okay. Yeah, you would need to have the extra slot like a Palpatine. Or a yeah. Master Force Luke or whatever. Sorry, the Jedi Luke. That yeah. one. The, these could be zero points, and you still would not take them a lot of the time. Yep. Yeah, there's just too many other good things to take. All right, uh, last one, Saber Throw. So... Mandatory on Vader? I, so... Uh, It used to be that was the case, definitely. I still think it's probably mandatory on Commander Vader, but with Darkness Descends, it's definitely... There's a world where you don't have to take it. Um, yeah. But 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 yeah, if you're taking Commander Vader, it probably should be stable to him, frankly. Um, there are also two new you know dooku and kenobi both can kind of do weird stuff with it i am 
like i get that it's very powerful what you can do with it um but it's and I, I know, Kyle, you're a big proponent of having operative loot take a saber throw. Um, but I, I do think the like fire support double attack thing with Dooku and Kenobi are a little bit more of a win more um, ability most of the time. That's not to say that they're not good. Uh, I just, I personally would rather have something else in that slot that does something unique and still be able to make those attacks. Like, I mean, it's not like you're not shooting something with dooku's one pip like you're still using it right so like uh, i don't know um the case I'd to like take the, it out. sorry no, go ahead i like to highlight one one case on dooku other than the the super laser kind of thing you do and that is during the one pip turn you're generating two suppression on things you hit hit range and you can then split fire with arsenal i think and hit two targets one with your throw and one with your um uh lightning and generate more suppression that way so that's one argument aside from the super laser on dooku Mm -hmm. but it's again you know it's one of the it's like six of one half a dozen the other between his lightning and the saber throw it's you know kind of a one-off on him and that's hardly a scene again on Dooku, it's very niche. Yeah. Same with Kenobi, really. K- Kenobi's is at least a lot more repeatable. Yeah. I, I, I feel like I can get behind that a little bit more. Um, but I still am not, like, overly convinced that it's great. Like, the thing is, if you can saber throw something, ex- specifically with Kenobi, like, you can charge it. Like, Yeah, you can probably just I, get in there. <laughs> You know, I, I don't know. I, is a fire supported th- three die attack really that much better than Kenobi just getting in there with tenacity? And and then you still have a, a shot left over? You know, I. I um, think with him, it's more that he has two four slots and you just don't have room for it. Yeah, that's also true. Mm-hmm. It does, it, it does, even if you don't have reliance, it does extend your range, you know, by one range band in so far as like. The attack is range two. So with sure. Shinobi or Jedi Luke, you know, you can jump as your first action and then throw range two. So you've got a range three attack threat range, which is still more than like their charge threat range. Look, as someone who's played a lot of a saber throw, it's just it's not good. You should avoid it when you can. <laughs> like it there if you catch something out of cover, great. That's not the game we play, really. Uh, and most of the time things are in heavy cover. Oh, a lot of the time. Now, I if you've got jump, maybe you can catch things. I I haven't I haven't toyed with Kenobi enough with saber throw to kind of make that assessment. But like I don't know, I've played a lot of saber throw on characters that only get three dice off their saber throw, and let me tell you, it's, it's real bad feeling to saber throw something in heavy cover. Yeah. So um, you mentioned Jedi Luke earlier. I run it on Jedi Luke. Um, So on Jedi Luke, I do push, mind trick, saber throw. Uh, And there's a couple of reasons for that. The first is that I have found that jump makes a big difference when it comes to catching things out of cover. Um, He does have the best of all the force users. He has the best saber throw attack because it's four blacks with surge crit. Yeah. so besides being the most dice, which gives you more critical chances for like going through cover and stuff, it's also the the highest raw average. Um, and it's pierced to impact too. So it's a great attack against vehicles, uh, particularly tanks. Um, and it's good against red save units in general. I, there's just a lot of situations for me with Luke where I don't want to like dive in there, but I still want to do some kind of useful last first. So I'll jump up you know, onto a building or something where I can get something in the open, do save a throw near the tail, tail end of a turn, pick up a couple models, um, and then go first with him the next turn, do it again and jump back behind cover. If I'm playing like a passive Luke, which I do a lot. So, um, I find it useful for that. Um, it's also really good with, um, if you can get aim tokens, which most force users can't, but Luke can with, uh, if you run R2, 3PO, it's great with calculate odds. Um, 
you know, you can use calculate basically at any point in the turn and then do what I just described, do like a last activation saber throw. And then you've got an aim token with four black pierce too. So I um, want to know when we're getting evil R2 and evil R2. <laughs> evil R2. You guys not, can, do, you, do you know what I'm talking about? You're, you're saying it like you don't know what I'm talking about. Is there like a canon representation of evil R2? Oh yeah, dude. Oh yeah. It's like triple zero and I, triple I'm zero and BT one, baby. Okay. Yeah. I, not like, they're, they're like three PO. Yeah. They're like they're like I I haven't they're read the actually. comics, but I think yeah. they're like they're like really scheming murdery assassin bots is what they are. Yeah, yeah. Um uh Doctor Afra, I think yeah. is the comic. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's also where my favorite my other favorite Wookiee, Black Kersantan, comes from. <laughs> the evil the evil Wookiee bounty hunter, mortal foe of Chewbacca. One of my favorite characters. I, I just, I want my evil, you know, 50 point calculate odds bots. That would be great. It's called an Arc Trooper. Y'all can't see the video stream, but Mike was like pickling. Oh, his... well, Arc Troopers aren't evil. I'm sorry. You're right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was so salty. <laughs> well, yeah, you know. I I, yeah, no, I, I agree. Salty. Calculate right. odds is ridiculous. It's That's a good. really strong ability. I mean, it's, it's like quick it's... thinking for anybody around you. Yeah, I mean, it's like calculate odds is like that one of those abilities. It's like on its face, you're like, oh, this isn't like this isn't that uh, that great. But um, like I don't know when you put it on a when you put it on like a force user, um, it's just it's it's so good. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's really like good. here's a free dodge token. It's like you know, here's the reflexes that you wanted to take, and here have a free aim token. <laughs> oh, by the way, and I cover. heard you wanted light cover too. Yeah, <laughs> like I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which, oh, oh, you mean you still get an action after you do that? Uh, all right. Okay. Yeah, with you know, on Jedi Luke, he's got courage four, so it's the one suppression. It's like, ah, oh, thanks for the cover. Yeah, it's like who cares? <laughs> yeah, I love I love calculate odds on Jedi Luke. It's awesome. So that's a long yeah. way of saying I like saber throw on Jedi Luke. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh-huh. I like saber throw a lot. Uh, it's underrated on it's, characters that are not Vader. It's worth mentioning, uh, since uh, we're anal about such things, that saber throw does not work with Son of Skywalker in the way that you think it does. Oh yes, um, because Son of Skywalker gives you a free attack after an attack action. Saber throw is an attack action. Uh, it is not a, an attack in the same way that like. You know, no time for sorrows is a move. It's not a move action. Um, so you cannot murder something with Jedi Luke and melee, and then uh, you saber throw something else because it's not an attack. If that makes sense. Uh, you also, for that same reason, well, not for that same reason, um, but since it's a card action and you can't do card actions twice, you also cannot double saber throw with Son of Skywalker. Um, the only way you can use it with Son of Skywalker is if it's the first attack you make. And the only situation where that's useful or feasible is if you're in combat with like a vehicle and you saber throw something else and then melee the vehicle. Um, that's pretty much the only time you, it works with Son of Skywalker. So keep that in mind. <laughs> doesn't work like you think it does, unfortunately, with that card. People people were using it incorrectly for like months and then somebody was like, wait, <laughs> this isn't how this goes. <laughs> and I think, I just, yeah. I, I remember the rules. It, it was it was specifically because of the Dooku thing. People were like, "Is this a ranged weapon? What is this?" And they were kind of like trying to figure out what the heck was going on. Yeah, uh, I thought it was after my game with Luke for Invader last season, where people oh. were, were like, "Why didn't you double saber throw the scouts in the?" Uh, in the oh, cars? oh, that might have been that might have been the yeah. one origin of it. But I've seen that this thread emerges from time to time. Like, is saber throw actually a ranged weapon? Yeah. And the, impl- it, the implication is that it is a ranged weapon. It's a melee weapon being turned into a ranged weapon. Yep. For the purposes of the ability. Yep. All right. So that was a um, that was a lot about force powers. Yeah, did man. We, you were going to do this. You're like, we're going to talk about this for 40 minutes. <laughs> no, man. Okay. It's a it's a great okay. subject. It's exhaustive. You know, especially cool. that part, Mike, where we're talking about force choke being like a, a half save or half force push. Really good stuff. Thank you. I, uh, yeah. it's, it's taken a lot of learning, <laughs> but you and I have yeah, played man. a lot of games with opposing force users. We have 
a lot. Yeah. Um, any final thoughts? Take force push every time, unless you're playing Palpatine. Like I, I don't know. Um, I strongly believe that, uh, you know, and other people like, choose to agree or disagree with this, that if you're taking an army in this game and it does not have force push in it, you are putting yourself at a severe disadvantage. Uh, I think that's a discussion for an <laughs> I, I sort of, I think I, I see Try where you're going with that. I have, <laughs> I have trouble when I play lists without force push, but I'm not sure if that's a crutch because there are a lot of people that are very successful with lists that do not include force push. Um, mm -hmm. It's a very unique effect. That's for sure. And I very much kind of, miss it when I don't have it. But I bet you I know it's in those lists. Well, <laughs> do they have short troopers and D twenty one Bs in them? <laughs> and you could also dogs. bow to your ninety point overlords. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but the point is, there are lists, you know, and also there are plenty of clone lists with racks too that don't have force push that are very good. So, uh, yeah, I'm not convinced that they hold up under scrutiny. But we'll see. We'll see. I think Invader League is going to be a good test of that because I expect to see a lot of Rex. I do too. And only Rex. Um, you know yeah. who melts? Rex. <laughs> yeah, he does. I think the I theory swear, is man, Every He's time not... I've played against Rex, he just <laughs> rip as soon as he gets exposed. I'm like, yeah. uh, hey, what's up? Yeah, what's I have up? these things over here that are called sniper rifles. Yeah. yeah. You don't, what's that? You don't have You're a stormtrooper? <laughs> Exactly, you're a stormtrooper. Yeah, yep, he's a stormtrooper yeah. squad. A literal stormtrooper squad. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, but we'll see. I think I think Invader League is going to be a good test of that theory. Um, I I personally, I, I think you and I are of the same mind that I, I personally struggle when I don't use it. Um, so, but anyway. All right. Uh, well, that is that on Force Powers. And... Um, Next week, hopefully, I'll have some more B1s painted. Maybe it'll be done next week. I'm a little skeptical. But, uh, uh, yeah, we are the Notorious Scoundrels. I'm Kyle. I'm Mike. And I'm David. And we'll see you next week. Get some painting done. Stay safe. Join us next week for another episode of the Notorious Scoundrels. This has been a Fifth Trooper production.